Well, Melanie, lovely to be here with you in your flat in London. Freedom. Um, it seems to me that very few people down through the ages, and even today, have known the sort of personal and political freedoms that we experience and enjoy and take for granted. And perhaps no country has written as good a book on freedom as Great Britain. Is it safe? Is it secure? Um, freedom and Britain, I would like to think, are indivisible. F Britain is the crucible of freedom. It's the uh, mothership of political liberty. Um, and that has many reasons, I think. Um, uh, certainly um, the fact that it's an island nation, or more um, accurately, a, a set of islands put together. But basically it's a, a nation bounded by the sea. And for a thousand years it's repelled all invaders. And I think that sense of geographical integrity has been a very considerable influence upon the fact that over the centuries Britain developed political liberty because it understood what it was to be a nation. That is to say, it understood what it was to be a body of people who were united by a common project which bound them together. And consequently, uh, in pursuit of that common project, it invented political liberty. And in my view, the notion of liberty that Britain invented is unique in the world and is unparalleled in the rest of the world. Other countries, such as Australia, have taken from it. Um, but if you look at, for example, the countries of mainland Europe and even America, I would say they have a more compromised idea of liberty than Britain. Britain's idea of liberty is fundamentally, uh, if I can uh, put something which is very complicated into a very short phrase, um, it's fundamentally whatever you want to do, you can do unless we tell you not to. The continental model, the continental European model is whatever you want to do is what we tell you you can do. In other words, it's codified. And America took that idea and ran with it as well as ideas from England, from Britain. And consequently, America is a kind of combination of the two forms of liberty. You might say it's what Isaiah Berlin, the philosopher, called negative and positive liberty. Uh, the idea that um, you can do whatever you want unless we stop you, which is the British idea, or the continental idea, which is you can only do what we tell you you can do, which is why France uh, had a French Revolution ostensibly to produce political liberty, which developed into one of the most bloody tyrannies ever known to humanity. Um, and consequently, it's Britain that I think where Britain, where, where, where liberty actually resides. And if liberty were to be snuffed out in Britain, and liberty depends very much upon that sense of everyone pulling together in a shared national project, which I would call the nation. If that gets snuffed out in Britain, then I think the consequences for liberty in Britain and for the rest of the world are very considerable. Well, this is of great interest to us in Australia. You've alluded to it. Uh, whilst Australians have been prepared to fight courageously, I think, uh, to defend freedom, the institutions, the machinery of freedom, the thinking around it, we've, we were fortunate enough to largely inherit the old saying, if you want to do well in life, choose your parents carefully. And we live in an age when people want to decry colonialism and so forth, but leave that debate to one side. We take our freedoms for granted and we value them greatly in Australia, but I don't know that we've thought them through properly. This concept that you've just alluded to, Isaiah Berlin, Oxford University, negative freedom, freedom from, positive freedom, to be what you like, but if you interpret that as license and start to restrict other people's freedoms out of selfishness, you can get this problem of losing your common identity as people become tin gods under themselves? I think, I mean, this is a very complicated and complex uh, set of issues that you've alluded to, um, and they all relate to each other. I think something has gone very badly wrong in the cradle of liberty, Britain. Um, insofar as its concept of liberty is concerned, its concept of rights and its concept of duties to each other and its concept of the nation pulling together as a common project. And these things are all, I think, linked. I think what happened to Britain uh, over 
really most of the last century um, was a process of demoralization in every sense. Um, Britain, as we know, was once a mighty empire that ruled the world. And as we also know, when it lost the empire, it never found a role. These are cliches, but they're basically true. And over the course of the 20th century, Britain lost its empire. Um, it also, although it played a very considerable role, perhaps the, cons the major role in winning the Second World War, it emerged from the Second World War in 1945 bankrupt, bankrupt in hock to America. Um, and it had also lost its empire. And the result of these two things, these two shocks to its system, I think profoundly demoralized its governing elite. They really did think that Britain could no longer uh, exist in the way that it had done as a mighty nation. It was spent, literally spent, it was bankrupt. And it had no political power in the world anymore because it no longer had an empire. And consequently, the governing elite believed that it could no longer go it alone and that it had to basically associate itself with something bigger than itself, which is kind of why it joined what became the European Union. It wasn't called the European Union then, it was the European Union project, but it joined up. Um, and in addition, um, the humiliation it felt at losing its empire, in the course of which uh, there was the disastrous Suez campaign of 1956, which was a national humiliation. Um, seen as a national humiliation, this, this loss of empire, this hu national humiliation, so demoralized the elites that I think they became open to obnoxious ideas at the heart of which lay the notion that the real problem for humanity in the wake of the Second World War, in the wake of the Holocaust, was the idea of the Western nation itself. And that arose from this belief, which I believe was fundamentally noble but misguided, that in order to stop the prospect, to halt the possibility of fascism and Nazism ever again stalking Europe, in order to prevent a second Holocaust, a second genocide, um, you had to get to the root cause of that. The root cause of that was said to be nationalism, that nationalism in Germany had become toxic and had led to the Holocaust, Second World War and so on, and that in order to stop nationalism, you had to basically end the primacy of the Western nation, that it was kind of overweening pride in the Western nation that led to nationalism. So you get rid of the primacy of the Western nation, then you get rid of nationalism and you stop prejudice and war. And so in order to uh, get rid of the Western nation, what you have instead, you have a confederation of nations. You have transnationalism. And so there grew up the idea that transnational institutions and laws, such as the United Nations, such as the European Union, such as international uh, law and international human rights law, these laws and institutions would take precedence, should take precedence over the laws and institutions of a Western nation such as Britain. Uh, and that furthermore, the idea that the Western nation, or the idea that the nation existed at all in the West was itself the cause of prejudice and conflict. Why? Because the nation was based on a sense of itself as exclusive. Why? Because the nation was based on the fact that it came out of its own particular history, particular to itself, its own traditions and institutions, particular to itself, its own culture, its own religion, its own language, its own literature, particular to itself. And consequently, if you were coming into that culture, you couldn't be part of it, not immediately. And consequently, by definition, the Western culture was racist because it was exclusive. And so to excise racism from the human heart, as it were, you had to subsume the nation in transnationalism. Now, all of this meant that British uh, institutions, the British cultural uh, political elite became very open to the idea, which was fundamentally Marxist revolutionary. 
uh, that the way you could bring about a revolution in the West, the way you could defeat the West, was not as Soviet communism had so disastrously shown could not be achieved. You should not expect the workers to rise up and seize power through grasping the levers of economic and political power. That would never happen. Anyway, it had gone wrong in Soviet Union. We didn't want that. Instead, you had to, what was called, achieve the long march through the institutions. You had to capture the citadels of the culture. You capture the universities, the media, the schools, the churches, the legal profession, all the other professions, the civil service. You get into them and you turn their minds so that instead of inculcating them with the values of the West, of Western civilization, Western culture, British national identity, and all of that, you inculcate them with the opposite. The idea that the West is bad, that the Western nation is bad, that the only good things are transnational institutions and, and, and laws, and you subvert the whole thing. And that's been done in Britain to the letter. There was, unlike in America, where there was a resistance, I think based on the bedrock of the, the American churches, which remain scripturally faithful and therefore remain the kind of bedrock of the conservative resistance to this, there was no such resistance in Britain. And as a result, the citadels of the culture fell one by one. It was all achieved perfectly. And so, having dissolved the very idea of the nation, of national identity, British national identity as being something that you were proud of, that had a history, that you would promote it, that you would defend it. In other words, the very idea of a common national project, what we have instead in Britain, growing up over the last 20 years or so, 20, 30 years, is uh, group rights. We have the fragmentation of British national identity into competing groups, gender groups, religious groups, ethnic groups, whatever, all competing for power and control over each other. And consequently, we have sacrificed harmony for combat, cultural combat. And we've sacrificed also the very idea that unified Britain in the first place, the idea of freedom because we've told ourselves it's racist to say that we are superior to any other culture. So we cannot say that our liberal ideals of liberty and equality and human rights are better than any others. And consequently, we are now fighting among ourselves as to which group has power over another group. Consequently, freedom and national identity in Britain, which are symbiotically connected, are both now in mortal peril. That is an extraordinary state of affairs. So we, we've come to a point of self-loathing. We want to decry the noble things that so many people in our own past have done. And if we can't paint it in such a bad light that people don't want to go there, we will airbrush it out well, so yes that people no. don't know. Well, yes and no, because I must qualify what I've just said. What I've just said applies to what I would call um, the governing elites, the cultural elites, the political establishment, the cultural establishment, the university-based uh, and university-educated classes. But, uh, and I think the Brexit vote showed this in 2016, there are millions and millions of people who understand at some level what's happened to the country and what's happened to the values that they hold dear and that they should hold dear and who don't subscribe to this way of thinking because they're not part of that elite set of individuals um, and they are resisting it. Um, and I think this is not just in Britain. I think we're seeing this phenomenon expressed in America in the people who voted President Donald Trump into office Whatever you think about President Donald Trump, I think that what he reflects, what he represents, is something very similar to the Brexit vote in Britain, which is the revolt against a way of thinking which has disenfranchised millions and millions of people 
totally disenfranchise them um, in that they have no political party to represent what they want and what they think. And furthermore, it hasn't just disenfranchised them, but has told them that they are stupid, that they are bigoted, that they are basically rubbish people for not believing the kind of things that the cultural elite believes. And those people are now in open revolt. And so we have a very interesting situation now, and I don't know how this is going to end, um, where the future of national identity and freedom and decency in Britain now hangs in the balance. And I believe it hangs in the balance also in America. So if we were having this conversation before the referendum in 2016, I would have said British society, you know, it's, it's, it's on a trajectory to disaster. Now I say there is a fight to the death between two views of the world, only one of which can win, um, and uh, liberty and national identity therefore hang in the balance. Very interesting. As a, almost an aside, but something that shows some light on this, we've just, we're seeing an incredible row in Australia, uh, a very, I think, outstanding Australian uh, left a very generous behest to set up a centre for the study of Western civilization in one of our major universities. I have to say the universities are losing the public debate hand over fist because they don't want it. They'll have centres for the study of all sorts of other cultures and political uh, forms, but not our own. And it doesn't pass what we would call the pub test. People in the streets who are paying for the universities are saying, what is going on here? So just before we come back to this issue of what Brexit and the Trump thing mean about people finally having a say and being determined to be heard, you have a you know, vast experience in this area of academia uh, and uh, elites, if you like, why is it that highly intelligent people in our universities seem unable to join up the dots, unable to respond to a proper understanding of history? I mean, for example, the pursuit of equality of outcome has never worked. Pursuit of freedom and justice has, and has delivered a reasonable degree of equality of outcome, but pursuing equality of outcome has always ended up killing freedoms. So why is it that in Australia, you've got about a third of the Australian people that self-describe as left and it's growing. Two thirds do not, they're moderate or they describe themselves as conservative. But that left, they've got everything. They've got the bulk of the political organisations, they've got a lot of the business communities, particularly in terms of social views. They've got the media and it all seems to be driven out of academia. Yeah. But academia surely should be doing research, should be knowing its history, should be pushing back on ideas that are demonstrably Unwise. Why, why, why is it not happening? Higher academia, certainly in Britain, um, lost the plot some decades ago when it substituted uh, um, ideology and propaganda for knowledge. Um, this goes back, I wouldn't like to put a date when it started, but I first cottoned onto it uh, when I was uh, writing for The Guardian. The, uh, uh, in media terms, you know, the centre of um, British leftism um, back in the 1980s. And I saw then that something was going disastrously wrong with education in schools and in universities. And the two were connected, uh, obviously. Um, but basically, the entire education establishment had come to the view that um, education itself, which is the transmission of a culture down through the generations um, could no longer transmit British and Western culture because that was racist. And not only was it racist, but it set, it, it, it institutionalized inequality. Why? Because it meant that some children would do better than others. And you had to avoid that. So I wrote a book about education called All Must Have Prizes. The title was taken from the Alice in Wonderland, was it Through the Looking Glass uh, books, where um, there's a caucus race uh, and the dodo, they're all going around in circles, and the dodo supervising the race says, no one has won and all must have prizes. 
And that was the philosophy behind education. You had to avoid anyone winning because um, you couldn't have any losers. Everybody had to be equal and equality was defined not as equality of opportunity, but as equality of outcomes. So regardless of your circumstance, you have to have the same outcome as everybody else. Now that, together with the deconstruction of the culture, the idea that the culture was basically racist and you couldn't then teach it, um, uh, destroyed education. It turned it inside out. And what we're now seeing in our universities today is the product of that. These are people who are teaching in our universities who themselves were taught in school or untaught in school. And instead of knowledge being transmitted, um, they were either left to find things out for themselves and or at the same time given propaganda, uh, which is basically the, 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 the um, promulgation of ideologies of one kind or another. So you have young people and not so young people now teaching universities for whom the very idea that there may be a contested view about man-made global warming is not only wrong, it mustn't be said. It mustn't be said. And the reason, and the, the reason why it mustn't be said is another issue which we might come on to because it's not just error we're talking about, it's heresy. And just as in the Middle Ages, um, the Catholic Church burned heretics at the stake, so the modern equivalent is if you say the wrong thing at universities, in universities, if you offend against the canon of leftism, leftist ideology in the universities, uh, you're out. You don't work. Uh, you are exiled uh, from the Eden of academia. And this, this, this process involved the, the deconstruction of the very idea of, of, of the, the concept that is at the heart of knowledge, which is truth. And the university has deconstructed that, so you don't have truth anymore. The idea that there's such a thing as objective truth is regarded as a sign of imbecility, if not insanity. Um, no, if you don't have objective truth, then if there's no such thing as objective truth, there's no such thing as a lie. And consequently, you have people who are open to lies. Now. This is all part and parcel of the substitution of knowledge for, of knowledge by ideology. Ideologies of various kinds. Ideologies meaning the idea holds sway, absolute sway. Nothing can challenge the idea. Uh, why? Because the ideas which I'm talking about, the ideas that are now the absolute orthodoxy on the left, are ideas which are said to embody goodness, virtue. They're said to embody the betterment of humanity. So if you stand against any of these ideas, if you say there's something fundamentally wrong with any of these ideas, you're not only wrong-headed, but you are evil because you are standing in the way of the betterment of humanity. Therefore, you want bad things for human beings. You want bad things for the earth, for the planet. And consequently, you can't be argued against. You must be stopped. You must be stifled. You must be refused a platform. Nobody must hear what you say. So what are these ideologies? There are many ideologies. Multiculturalism, the idea that you cannot say Western society or any society is better or worse than any other. Lifestyle choice, the idea that you cannot say any kind of family household arrangement is better or worse than any other, and so on and so forth. Now, the point about an ideology, as I've just said, is that the idea is absolute. It cannot admit to any dissent or challenge whatsoever. So they actually do believe in a truth, in an absolute Ab truth. Well, rather like the Catholic Church of medieval period, believe in the absolute truth. But the fact is this, the ide the, the, an ideology is therefore inimical to reason itself. Because if you come along with a set of facts and you say, here are facts uh, which challenge your idea of whatever it is. Um, uh, here are facts which show that children are better off with a father and a mother. Here are facts which show that the earth was warmer many millennia ago. Here are facts which show whatever. 
and they contradict the governing idea of the ideology. Uh, you are told, no, 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 we cannot have this. These cannot be facts. You are lying. You must be lying. And we won't even hear these facts. In other words, we're in a situation now where ideology says evidence is nowhere. Now, if evidence is nowhere, then rationality and reason are nowhere because you cannot have reason without evidence and without the idea of truth and lies being different from each other. And so we have this really horrific and terrifying situation in which the brightest and the best of us in our universities, the people entrusted with the education of our young people, the people entrusted with the transmission of our culture, the people entrusted with thinking great thoughts, are themselves promulgating a culture which has become inimical to reason itself and they believe that they stand for reason. They believe and they tell us that anyone who objects to any of this is stupid, is an imbecile. Their imbecility demonstrated by the fact that they believe in something as ridiculous as objective truth. But they themselves are presiding over and have made our universities into crucibles not of knowledge but of the destruction of reason itself. And so what we're living through in Britain and the West, in my view, is even worse than the potential destruction of political liberty, even worse than the destruction of the very idea of the Western nation and national identity. We're living through the destruction of reason. And all around us we find that rational argument, discussion, civil discourse encompassing ideas which may compete with each other. We may have disagreements and be civil to each other. All gone. It replaced by insult. Insult designed not just to wound but to silence. To, silence. to shut down the yes. argument. Silence, yeah. It's one of the most terrifying situations one can imagine. Because surely it strikes at the very heart of the Western genius for freedom in that the reference you made to burning people at the stake for holding a minority view came to be seen as unchristian, unwise, in fact stupid because today's minority might end up being tomorrow's majority and they might turn it around. So we learnt how to cope with and even make a virtue out of polite disagreement and dissent. Surely that is laying at the heart of the Western freedom. And then built on that, of course, was the right to manifest your most deeply held convictions, your conscience, your religion, yeah. freedom of speech. Yeah. And you're painting a picture that both are being decried by people who frankly should surely know better. To be freedom and reason go together. Um, uh, it was Voltaire, uh, not British, I'm afraid, French, but nevertheless, I won't hold that against him. Um, who said, um, I may disagree with you, but you know, I will defend to the death your right to disagree with me, or words to that effect. But the, but the creed now seems to be, if you dare disagree with me, I'll label you a hater yes. and a racist, Correct. and I'll fight to the death Correct. your right Correct. to say it. And you see, what strikes me as so very interesting, if one can stand back from this dreadful situation and be objectively interested, is that, you know, when people want to silence you, um, what, what's motivating them? Fear. Yes. What are they frightened of? Why are they so frightened of the argument? Why are they so frightened they have to silence you? It's a very powerful point. Because they know that what they are saying is built on sand. They know that if they have to have an argument based on reason, on evidence, on facts, they'll lose. It's fear. And consequently, the, f and the fear is, is so overwhelming because they know, they know they can't have the argument. So they have to stop you. So they stop people having platforms. They drive people out of the universities. They, they stop people, you know, in the media. It's very subtle. Not many uh, newspapers or media outlets are stupid enough to censor people. 
they just deprive you of the platform. You somehow can't ever find a way of getting onto the television or the radio to say the things you want to say. Similarly, in the universities, it's a bit less subtle, they try and drive people out. They do drive people out. Well, they do. And we that intimidates that. people. If mm. you think you're going to lose your job, it's a bit of a disincentive to speaking up, mm. to put it mildly. Um, and consequently, um, we have a situation in which not just dissent, but the free flow of ideas upon which freedom is based um, is dying. It's dying. And this thing is correlated almost entirely with the thinking classes um, who are not thinking at all. Um, they're shutting down thought, the so-called thinking classes. Um, I find, you know, the, the lower down the social order one goes, the more one encounters people who, are, uh, who don't have um, um, a higher education, who are not part of the governing or political or intellectual elites, the more sensible and the more decent they are. Because they're basically their lives are rooted in reality. Whereas the higher up the social educational scale you go, the more you find people who live in the world of ideas and they live in the world of fantasy. They live in a world where they want the world to be in a way they want the world to be what it's not. They want the world to be better than it is. And in their minds, it has to be better than it is. And so it is better than it is. And they won't believe that it isn't. They won't connect with reality as it is. And it's very so elitist. They force people into the lie that they share, which is basically living in a world of fantasy, in which they say the world is this, but it's not. It's not. And consequently, um, there are millions of people who are decent, ordinary people who are looking at what's happened to their culture and their society in Britain and in, 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 in America, and I'm sure in Australia as well, and they can't understand what's happened. They think everyone's gone mad. Well, this is the point I make in Australia. The universities, I don't think they realise it, but they're losing the debate over this proposed Centre for Western Civilization hand over fist the punter, as you might call them, in the street, is rightly saying, what is going on? Are, do these people actually care about us? Do they care about our freedoms? Do they, are they real? You're seeing this elitism, this, this pride, really, this sort of patronising attitude that the masses couldn't know. Um, they're ignorant. They shouldn't be allowed. I mean, you've seen quite prominent people in this country saying those who voted for Brexit shouldn't have a vote. They're not well enough informed. They're not intelligent enough. I must say I learnt in 19 years in public life in Australia, the biggest fool was the one who didn't think that the person out in the back blocks of your electorate with no formal education didn't have a legitimate and intelligent mm. thought through position because often their wisdom was quite astounding if you just took the time to hear them. So you've got this terrible elitism. Now you've got a situation where perhaps they didn't see it coming, but they had the opportunity to send a very clear message when they got a vote on remaining or leaving Europe. And then in America, an unusual proposition turned up whereby they could sort of say to the establishment, we've had enough. Both, in a sense, are very much uncompleted works. We don't know where they're going to go. It seems to me that the situation is inherently quite dangerous. Mm. What happens, for example, in this country, if the majority will, it might have been narrow, but it was a majority, and it was a clear call for yep. respect and a clear cry that we've not been heard and we feel marginalised. What happens if that is somehow ignored or overridden? If that were to happen, and it could happen, uh, we're in the middle of a crisis at the moment, which heaven knows how it's going to resolve itself, in which um, it, uh, Mrs May's Conservative government um, is, has been proposing to leave the European Union on terms which mean that you don't leave at all uh, in real terms. The people have protested and she has retreated a little, but the fight is on and this is a fight to the death by people who want to reverse Brexit. Now, if they succeed, if Britain ends up not leaving the European Union, because in my view, you either leave or you don't leave. There's no half leaving. If you're half in, half out, you're still in. If that were to happen, um, 
I think the consequences for Britain are incalculably bad. First of all, the consequences for the Conservative Party are um, uh, really quite dramatic in that people will never vote Conservative again who voted for Brexit. Uh, because what's the point of a Conservative Party if it can't even conserve British national identity and democratic, independent self-government? I mean, it's a nonsense. And related to that is the even more dangerous situation, which people will kind of give up on democracy completely. Because Mrs May hitherto has used as a human shield the dread prospect of Jeremy Corbyn coming to power. Jeremy Corbyn, ultra-left leader of the Labour Party, Everyone's very frightened that he might come to power. So her mu potentially mutinous Conservative Party has not dumped her for fear of triggering a general election, which might mean that Jeremy Corbyn comes to power. Now, if the British public who voted for Brexit believe that Britain is not going to leave the European after all, that it will remain a kind of province as Boris Johnson, the newly resigned Foreign Secretary, has memorably said, as a colony of the European Union, then they will say to themselves, what's the point of voting? What's the point of Parliament? We're not sovereign. Who cares if Jeremy Corbyn comes to power? OK, he's a nasty piece of work. He can do some damage. But ultimately, what he really wants to do, he won't be able to do either, because the European Union won't let him. So what's the point? So there will be, I think, a catastrophic drop of um, engagement with the democratic process itself. And that is incredibly dangerous because that does open the way for who knows what might happen. Anarchic, antisocial, um, destructive forces to come forward and by dint of not having any kind of um, uh, leadership in the country as a whole, uh, by dint of sort of electoral chaos, chaos in the, in, within the electorate, they may come to some kind of power, or I might find that power goes onto the streets, something that's very un-British. The British don't do revolutions, the British don't do extremes. The British are stoical and they endure, but, when their backs are to the wall, they fight. And what we're fi finding now is that they're fighting. The ordinary people are fighting uh, in the way that they know in Britain, not by taking to the streets, not by burning down the environment, but by word, by showing that they are going to no longer support their conservative members of parliament. They're putting pressure on through the democratic process, but they're showing that they won't put up with this negation of democracy, this negation, this attempted negation of their expressed desire through a referendum vote to leave the European Union. That's what they voted for, that's what they want to do. And you're quite right, those people have been dumped on from a great height by the people who, for whom it's axiomatic that to have pride in Britain as a country, to believe in Britain as a discrete entity, to want to govern yourself as a separate nation is so fundamentally wrong-headed that nobody but a bigot and a xenophobe and an imbecile could possibly believe that. These are the foundations of British democracy and liberty and human rights. And they've been, not only are those things dismissed, but the people who want them um, have been uh, not just dismissed, but smeared. Um, the Remainers, the, the ultra-Remainers, I should say, not all Remainers are the same. I have a lot of sympathy for people who voted Remain because they thought that however awful the European Union was, coming out would be so terrible we couldn't take that risk. So there are many Remainers who I think are perfectly sensible and rational people, but there are ultra-Remainers for whom the idea of Britain ruling itself as a self-governing, independent, democratic nation is irrelevant because they don't believe in that. They believe that actually it should be subsumed into a European Union, that that's, that is the way human progress is carried forward through transnational institutions. 
for all the reasons that we've been discussing, because British national identity is racist and all the rest of it, exclusive and bigoted and, and, and so on. So those people have dumped on the Brexit voting public from a great height, and they genuinely believe that you cannot possibly, nobody could have voted for Brexit for noble reasons. They genuinely cannot believe that anybody could have voted for Brexit because they wanted national sovereignty. They say, what? Nobody went into that ballot box, ballot booth, the voting booth, uh, thinking, oh, what you want is national sovereignty. Okay, possibly not. What they're saying is, those people, what they really wanted was no immigrants because they're basically racist bigots. Well, immigration was a very significant element, but not immigration in the sense that we all used to understand immigration. What people were frightened of was losing control of their borders so that the idea that there should be any stop to immigration would be removed. The, that, that there should be no stop to immigration, that Britain, because it's part of the European Union with its free movement uh, uh, beliefs, uh, would uh, have no way of stopping the kind of level of immigration that would cause its public services to collapse and would actually collapse its idea of itself in cultural terms as a nation. Now, the very idea of believing that Britain has the right to say it has a discrete cultural identity. For many Remainers, that's anathema, that's racist. So they are against the idea of Britain being able to determine its own destiny on the basis of its own discrete and unique and separate history, traditions, culture, language, and all the rest of it. And that's the fight that's now on. Um, how it will end at this moment, talking to you now, I have no idea. But it threatens to tear the country apart, and it is incredibly dangerous. Yes, this uh, being at one another's throats, the culture wars right across the West, very concerning. I think it's probably made a lot worse, frankly, by the advent of social media. Uh, which is particularly effectively used by elites. Uh, and it's interesting that uh, it seems to me that very often they'll be the first to say, you can't use language like that, that's hate speech, or that's um, racist or whatever. But they'll do nothing to contain or to even condemn the appalling way people talk to one another via social media. The idea that, you know, this whole business of, you know, safe spaces and hate speech um, are all about producing a kinder, more gentler, more tolerant, uh, freer world. It's the opposite of the case. Um, what it's all about is exerting, is certain groups exerting power over other groups to silence them. That's what that's about. And we can see that very clearly uh, by the fact that um, the kind of uh, hatred that's directed at um, men, um, capitalism, um, the West, um, uh, the state of Israel. Uh, None of that's called uh, out. Uh, that's it's, encouraged. It's encouraged. At the same and time as they more, say they're against Even more speech. absurdly, it's turning on its own. So you have, for example, somebody who was you know, so prominent in, I would say, ultra-feminism, Germaine Greer, um, being turned on and almost prevented. She may have been prevented, but certainly she was almost prevented from speaking on various platforms on the basis that she had the temerity to say that an individual who was equipped with male genitalia was actually a man, even though that person might say that that person was a woman, she was immediately become, it be, became a non-person and was almost prevented from having any platforms at all. So, you know, even people who have been part of this awful business of fragmentation into group rights fighting for power over others. You know, ultra-feminism is basically anti-man. They themselves are being eaten alive. I mean, it's just like the French Revolution. You know, the people who started guillotining the aristocracy were themselves guillotined mm. by others. Yeah. 
They, the revolution eats its own. That's what we're finding also. So this adds a level of surrealism to what is already such a dangerous and distressing situation. You paint a worrying picture. It's hard to argue with it. You see it here in the newspapers. You see it here in the way people talk about one another. I don't want to say that Australia is any different. I'm very concerned about the way in which we're pulling one another apart, the way in which the elites say essentially a whole lot of Australians shouldn't be given a say. But people are pushing back. That's the point. Quite. What's needed now to put it at its most simple keep the public square open for respectful, decent debate and the proper allowing of dissenting views in order that our assumptions and our prejudices can genuinely be tested, surely the mark of any free society? Well, <laughs> what's needed is political leadership um, to actually give a lead, uh, to actually call out the real hate, to stand up against it uh, rather than give in to it. I mean, in Britain, we've had a conservative government for some years now. <coughs> um, uh, but it's uh, conservative in name only. In fact, it's not even conservative in name only. It doesn't even know what it has to conserve anymore. Um, Mrs May, the current Prime Minister, seems to believe that um, the left has all the best tunes when it comes to conscience and decency. Where has she got that from? She's a conservative. She, she invented the term, the conservatives were the nasty party. Now, some aspects of conservatism, or the, the conservative party, I'm sure are nasty. Some aspects of everybody, everything is nasty. But there's a lot more nastiness on the left. And the idea that the left is the kind of repository of decency, I'm afraid, was exploded uh, many decades ago. So we have a situation where we have no political leadership in Britain, none. Uh, that stands up for these values and that defends them, that will fight this war. Unlike in America, our church, the Church of England, has been in the forefront of the collapse. It's been in the forefront of appeasing uh, secularism because what this is really, what we're talking about is militant, aggressive secularism. Uh, the idea that the morality enshrined uh, in Christianity, which derives originally from the Hebrew Bible, which gives us our sense of equality. It gives us our precepts of morality being we put a other people before our own self-interest. Which we don't find in other culture and belief systems. Exactly I so. I constantly that issue that challenge. Quite. People say, oh no, all the great religions and belief systems do. No, they don't. No, no. Uniquely, the Hebrew Bible and Christianity, which gave expression to it, believe in putting other people first, in e real equality, because we are all made equal in the image of God. We've substituted for that man-made equality, which is that the only equality is what the judges using man-made law tell us is equality. There's a whole range of topics like that, um, which fall under the same kind of, of, of rubric um, in which we've kind of sawn off the branch on which we sit. We've sawn off the cultural branch on which we sit. We're be in becoming a cut flower society. This is all, this is all very true. On the other hand, there is, as you say, a fight back going on. Um, and I believe it can work, but it needs leadership. Now, Britain is suffering from a complete absence of leadership. What we need is a leader uh, to explain to the people, look, for example, Brexit. This is the, the issue that's currently tearing us apart. If I, were, if I were leading the country, what I would say, what I would have said, uh, would be the following. I would say, look, we voted to come out of the European Union. Um, we voted to do so because we want control of our own destiny. That is the most important thing for all of us. The downside is going to be a downside. There must be a downside. You don't leave the European Union tied as we are through a, a web of laws and, and treaties and obligations and arrangements. You don't leave it without pain. And there may well be a downside, but we'll take the hit because ultimately, this country is so great and so strong that we will be able to take them to the cleaners in the European Union. They're a basket case. So have faith. Be strong. We'll be strong. This is what this country does. It's strong and it does stuff. That's what I would have said. At the European Union, I would have said, 
We voted. We're going. We're out. We don't want a deal. We're prepared to take the hit. But WTO rules, whatever, tariffs, we'll take the hit because we'll take you to the cleaners. You want to deal with us? Fine. We're your friends. We'll always be your friends. Our door will always be open to you. You want to deal with us? Come and talk to us anytime. Meanwhile, goodbye. Now that's leadership. Now, we don't have that. Instead, we have had a prime minister who has taken a very strong card and has pretended or assumed that it is the weakest card in the pack and has gone on hands and knees begging to the European Union uh, not to hit us. And as a result, they've hit us in the solar plexus and are prepared to do so again. It's not rocket science. Now, look at America. With regard to President Trump, um, you have a completely different situation from what obtains in Britain. Now, I have great reservations about President Trump. I share many, if not most, of the concerns about his personality, his temperament, his, his fitness for office, um, the fact he can't take criticism. I mean, these things fill me with a great deal of fear. But at the same time, I think one has to give the man credit for what he is showing, which is leadership. Um, he uh, represents, he knows he represents, uh, what the people want who voted him in. What do they want? They want someone who stands up for America, for American interests, for the American people. He embodies all of that, and I believe that's absolutely genuine. He will fight for America, for American interests, and American, the American people. He will also stand up for and fight for the rule of law, um, as we can see from his attempts to, um, to end uh, illegal immigration and all the wrinkles, sanctuary cities and all the rest of it, in which uh, the political class, the democratic political class, has colluded in the wholesale, institutionalized subversion of and breaking of law in the interests of bringing in migrants. Now, the people have voted to end that because they want the rule of law, and he has agreed, and that's what he's doing. That's represented by the elites in Britain and in America as fascism, because as far as they're concerned, to exercise the rule of law by a Western democratic nation is a kind of fascism, and that's because of their warped view of, of, Western, of Western nations. Now, the point about Trump is this, that whatever you think about him, he is showing leadership. Um, he's doing what, um, uh, he's, he, he's telling the people what he's doing all the time. He's saying, I'm standing up for you, and he is doing it. He's creating jobs, he is protecting American interests abroad, He's doing what he says he's going to do, what he promised them th that he would do, and he's explaining it all the time to them. So he's taking them with him all the time. He's delivering, and he's explaining, and he's presenting what he's doing in a way that they all identify with, because that's what they wanted, and they're having it reflected back to them. So this is all political leadership. You have to take the country with you. Now, in Britain, uh, Mrs May has made no attempt whatsoever ever to take the country with her on Brexit. And nobody in the political class at all is attempting to take the country with them in the opposite direction uh, in, f in terms of the culture wars, because nobody actually wants to go in that direction anyway. Uh, nobody wants to fight the culture wars. Trump is fighting the culture wars um, in his own way. Whether you agree with him or not, that's what he's doing. He is leading. In Britain, we have nobody at the moment who will take that on, who will take on the university-based view that the Western nation is terrible, that British national identity is terrible, that traditional values to do with family education are terrible. No one is prepared to take those on. And until and unless Britain has a political leader who will take them on, then all those millions of ordinary, decent, British people are going to remain disenfranchised and the cultural crisis that we can see now erupting in Britain in the political crisis of Brexit, but as a cultural crisis, will continue. You're a very astute observer of these things. Thank you for your time. You write regularly. If people want to follow, given that we say in Australia the trends that emerge in Britain and America arrive there pretty shortly afterwards, there'll be, I think, um, a lot of interest in following this debate. Where do they find you? <laughs> well, um, I have a website on which I put all the uh, work that I do, uh, which is can be found at uh, melaniephillips.com. Melanie Phillips, all one word, two L's and Phillips. 
I also write books. Um, I wrote a book which was published recently uh, in the United States uh, called Guardian Angel, which is a personal and political memoir uh, through the prism of what happened to me and my change of world view uh, over the last 20, 30 years. I kind of present the kind of things we're talking about today, um, what's happened to Britain and the West. And I've also written a novel, my first novel, uh, which is called The Legacy, uh, which is about um, the power of history. It's about conflicted national identity and it's about anti-Semitism through the ages. Thank you very much. Thank you.